Welcome. Um, hello to everyone out there on Zoom. Um, uh, thank you all for joining us today and whenever you're watching this. Um, my name is Heather Boucher. I am the president and uh, co-founder and CEO of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to invite you to, to uh, have you all here for this conversation today. At Equitable Growth, our goal is to advance evidence-backed ideas and policies in promote of growth that is strong, stable, and broadly shared. And we believe fundamentally that starting with inequality allows us to dig deeper than the current political economy. Um, traditionally, economic models tend to ignore economic inequality and allows us to push to the fore really important questions around economic and political and social power. And in equitable growth, we look at all the different ways that inequality in all of its forms could affect economic growth and stability, from obstructing the development and the deployment of people and their skills and talents into the economy, to how inequality subverts the governance of our markets and um, governance more generally of our democratic institutions, to the ways that this all distorts the macro economy to its effects on consumption and investment, and then we bring all of this work and these ideas together to knit together a story to help policymakers understand how they connect policies that promote growth while um, also intending to these um, really shocking trends that we continue to have in terms of inequality. So in November of 2019, we hosted our Vision 2020 conference, which started the conversation on what the vision for a new economy should look like and who it should serve. And then in February, right before we all went home, uh, or many of us went home for coronavirus, we released our book, Vision 2020, which is a compilation of 21 essays authored by world-class scholars from around the country, each of whom propose a bold evidence-backed policy idea to address inequality in order to have an economy where growth is indeed strong, stable, and broadly shared. Every single essay includes actionable ideas that can be implemented by whomever is in power, and all of the authors stand ready to help um, craft and execute on these policies. And all of this, of course, is available on our website. I think it just went up on the chat there. And of course, my team, um, the fantastic team at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth are here and can help if you want to know more about any of the authors or the essays or um, other resources to turn these ideas into action. Now, back when we were planning our Vision 2020 project, we knew that 2020 would be a year where the nation would really sit down and think about uh, what kind of economy we had and what kind of economy we wanted because it was a presidential election year. Those are years when we tend to debate these kinds of concepts. And yet um, the recession um, that has been caused by the coronavirus pandemic um, is also another moment where we are um, really thinking deeply about what's working in our economy, what's not working, and critically the important role that inequality plays in our economy today. So um, I have the privilege of being able to moderate this first panel today. And um, the two experts that we've invited um, both have a deep understanding of how the rules and institutions that govern our financial system shape economic inequality, which in turn affects our entire economy. During the Great Recession, we learned how bailing out asset holders while practicing austerity for everyone else led to those at the top recovering quickly, but not so much for the rest. We also learned how inequality renders monetary policy less effective as a macroeconomic um, stability tool and the limits of the toolbox that our monetary authorities have. Now, of course, during this pandemic, we're seeing how important the Federal Reserve has become, not just for traditional monetary policy, but making um, very important decisions about the future composition of our economy. Of course, the exhibit one for this is the CARES Act, which directs a large degree um, of fiscal policy responsibility over to the Fed, something that we're gonna be talking about here today. How should we think about this? Do we need to reform the structures of our financial system, the role of the Fed in our economy, or do we need to develop new institutions? So we're gonna dig into these questions today with our two panels, panelists, um, Marissa Baradaran and Emma Coleman-Jordan. So Mersa is a professor of law at UC Irvine, at the UC Irvine School of Law, and she's a member of Equitable Growth's um, Board of Directors. Um, she is an expert on banking law, financial inclusion, inequality, and the racial wealth gap. 
Her book, The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, was recognized with a number of awards and received significant media coverage. This, of course, includes a recent trip back in February to Louisville, Kentucky, where the whole city read The Color of Money, um, and my in-laws bragged to me about how awesome the event was before they even knew that I knew Mersa. So I was excited to tell them that she was on our board. Um, Emma is the J. Criley Kelly and Terry Curtin Kelly Professor of Business Law at the Georgetown University Law Center. Emma is best known for establishing the field of economic justice in legal theory and her, for her really important work in financial services and civil rights. Her textbook called Economic Justice, Race, Gender, Identity, and Economics is a capstone to a series of articles, chapters, and books she's written on this subject. I could not be more thrilled to be able to have this conversation here today with these two fantastic scholars. Um, before we get to my first question for them, I want to take just a moment and give a big shout out to my team at Equitable Growth. Um, there, so many people helped to organize this event today, and um, I know I am very, very grateful. And we also want to give a special shout out to all of our funders who helped make um, our programming possible. So without further ado, I want to turn into our first question. And um, so I'm going to start with you, Marissa, um, although I think I'd like you both to weigh in on this. So Emma, you can chime in after or you can or we can go for a follow up uh, uh, if you if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a perception that the Fed intervenes in the economy, that the Fed, that the Federal Reserve's interventions in the economy um, are just seen as bolstering, quote, the market which is viewed as sort of a, as, a, as a neutral thing, right? We need to protect the market. We need to, um, you know, focus on uh, maintaining the economy. But this presumes in some ways that the market is natural um, or that the Fed doesn't have um, other, um, that its activities don't actually have an effect on other policy goals, such as around distribution or compositional questions um, or um, things around thinking about climate change or you know, how we might build a faster payment system for individuals and families, a whole range of issues that really are not sort of wrapped up in the, the way that we often think about how the Fed is interacting. Um, so Marissa, can you talk for a moment about how you think about these questions and um, whether or not you think that deploying the Fed is a neutral choice? Um, yes, that's a great question. And I think the short answer is it is absolutely not neutral. The Fed's charter mission, um, you know, in the progressive era by uh, President Wilson and, and the coalition that, that created the Fed was very much, you know, a mandate to, you know, look at, you know, monetary policy and do that, but also to look at, you know, the um, equ equity and access um, to the tracks on which the economy runs. And over the last, you know, 50 years with the, the rise of sort of this market fundamentalism, it has really just focused on monetarism and, and um, tinkering with inflation um, factors. And so I was actually just, you know, at another um, uh, talk where we were talking about how to more um, sort of democratize monetary policy. And someone was like, well, aren't you worried that if we um, create, if we make the Fed more, um, uh, you know, open to public, um, you know, uh, push more democratic that we would, you know, that would be bad because we would lose something, right? Some, some expertise and, and, and technical um, stuff. And I'm like, what makes you think that the Fed is not, um, you know, politically influenced? And, and that I think is the biggest myth is that it is this neutral um, technocratic response to these market principles in the abstract. And that when it, you know, buys up QE or gives interest on reserves or tinkers with um, certain metrics that it is just, you know, the, the market at large when it is not. It is a very clear um, certain market. It is certain people in that market. And the, the way that the Fed's monetary responses over the last several decades have massively increased these gaps and created um, wealth for asset holders in certain markets and deprived it um, from others is absolutely a political decision. It was not framed as such, but the effects were very much felt by people in the economy. And so we absolutely need to look at those things. And I'm not saying everyone should vote on um, uh, all of those metrics, but but there has to be voices at the table say, well, how does this, how did this, these rounds of QE affect the black white racial wealth gap? How do they affect uh, employment as a central issue? That's such a, thank you. Um, Emma, would you like to um, weigh in on this question as well? Yes, absolutely. I agree that the Federal Reserve is governed by a set 
of ideological principles and commitments. They are committed to market determinism, mm -hmm. and they have reinforced that ideological commitment with the people who are hired and who run the show. Uh, the economists, the <coughs> neoclassical we trained economists are the people who they rely on for ideas and for implementation. And so that leads to a kind of orthodoxy that excludes considering individuals, excludes considering race. I remember I did a research paper a few years ago where I looked at all of the Federal Open Market Committee uh, minutes that were available at that time. And I did a search for race uh, in the period leading up to the financial crisis in 2008. And I did a Boolean search, meaning, you know, race in all of its various forms. Do you know how many hits I got? Zero. And so it's no surprise that the ideological commitment of the Fed to ignore race as a variable in looking at growth and looking at the well-being, economic well-being of Americans, uh, produce the kind of cognitive narrowness and blindness that led to the financial crisis. And the corollary principle here with this idea of uh, market determinism is the idea that it's all neutral <clears throat> and that financial innovation is good. Uh, that's what brought us these horrible uh, mortgage products, the predatory practices that Alan Greenspan refused to uh, rein in when the Fed was the only one with statutory authority to do that. So that um, is really important to think about the Fed as being under the sway of an idea. Now, it's interesting. Uh, many people, I think, will remember this classic clash between Alan Greenspan and uh, Congressman Henry Waxman, where Waxman mm -hmm. asked him, this is after the financial crisis, he said, um, were you under uh, an idea? What were your operating principles? And with a little bit of uh, comeback, uh, Greenspan said, yes, we all have some way of thinking about how the world operates. But the bottom line of his answer was, I was wrong. For 40 years, I've been working under the assumption that we have mm -hmm. markets that will correct, self-correct, and that regulation is not uh, necessary government intervention. So that's the first thing to know about the Fed. It is under this set of ideological commitments and it's going to be hard to root out. I've got some ideas for how to root them out. And if you want to go to those now, I can talk. Well, let, me, let me just take a pause so we can kind of do a little bit of back and forth. I think that is, I mean, this idea that what the Fed is protecting and um, the, the models implicit in how they're thinking about the economy, their role in it, um, it's, it's interesting to, to kind of start our conversation there um, in, in all of your answers. You know, one of the things that, um, and I want I do want to get to solutions in this in this question. Like, um, I know that you both have big, bold, um, structural solutions to think about for what to do with the Fed um, and financial institutions more generally. But could we pause as you're thinking about answers, so as you go into that? Um, one thing that I have been, you know, watching very carefully, and I know you both have as well, is because the Fed now has these new powers um, because of the CARES Act and because of the crisis. Um, many people are concerned that the Fed is really acting at this point more as a fiscal agent, making decisions about um, uh, uh, what, which, 
uh, how much aid to give to specific firms and the like in ways that it hasn't had to do before. And that opens new doors in terms of how policymakers are thinking about the role of the fiscal um, and the role of the monetary authorities. Um, so maybe if you could weave that into the answers in terms of how you're thinking about structural change. And just to break it up, so I'll go back to Mersa and then I'll go back to you, Emma. We can do a little bit of back and forth. Um, yeah, I, um, I show that clip that Emma mentioned uh, on the Greenspan and his quote was, there was a flaw in my thinking. Um, and it's a classic understatement of theory. And, you know, I go back to the Joan Robinson quote, uh, the classic, you know, economist who was forgotten during that era, um, where she says, you know, uh, uh, ideology is like breath. Everyone has it, but you can't smell your own, right? And so I think that was part of the thing is like, there is this non-ideological um, spin. But as far as your question of how, um, uh, the Fed acting as a fiscal agent as opposed to not is, is part of, I think it is an indictment of our um, failures in democracy. I think it's impossible to get anything passed in Congress. You know, I was listening to uh, uh, Mitt Romney talk um, just last night where he says, you know, the thing with the Senate is the party in power, and he is in the party in power, has all the power. And you can't get anything on the floor unless you're the party of power, is that Mitch McConnell just decides what gets heard, even if there's the majority consensus, if he doesn't put it on the floor for a vote, we don't get it. There's all sorts of these problems with our democracy. And so we end up relying on these other things. Another thing is securities fraud. You know, I, um, I think Matt Levine is a, uh, someone I follow on the econ side, and he says everything is securities fraud. And so the way that we filter um, these social concerns through the securities fraud framework and other ways, right? We talked about Andrew Ross Sorkin has this famous idea of we can get um, gun control through, um, you know, uh, putting pressure on banks to not lend to certain things or we can tamp down on this stuff. All of that stuff I think is a symptom that our democracy is broken, that we're relying on Fed monetary policy to do fiscal things that we all I think want and can't get through the channels that are supposed to be doing that. So I think that's the fundamental issue is we, we don't have a one vote, one um, person democracy. We have a, a real sort of capture of a lot of these agencies. And so I think we, we, we really, you know, so we can talk about how the Fed can do better on doing fiscal policy. And I'm here for that. And I have a lot, lots of ideas there. But it really is, we have to recognize that this is a failure. Of, there, there are better institutions for this. Um, the same, I think, can be said of using credit policy um, for stimulus in, you know, historically we use these credit policy and part of this to, is because of this, this um, constrained thinking on budgets and deficits. So we'll just say, okay, we'll just do credit guarantees. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are on the, the balance sheets, are off the balance sheets of the federal government, but they're in conservatorship. And that's a problem that we have to look squarely and not pretend that is not on the government's balance sheet. So I, so I think all of this stuff is part and parcel of this, this rot within the center. Um, and and those, those are the people responsible to do fiscal policy. So would you suggest then, Marissa, just to follow up, would, so you said you have a bunch of ideas for fixing the Fed, but do you think that fundamentally this is, it, it sounded like what I'm taking from what you just said is that fundamentally we need to fix Congress. Is that, yes. is, is that what you would, would you stand by that statement? <laughs> I stand by that statement. I think the Fed, the Fed is, um, you know, delegated. Congress has delegated their authority to the Fed and the Fed is under the, you know, they're, they're working for the American people through their representatives, which is Congress, and they were, you know, uh, 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 deployed in 1913 to do these these mandates, and it's changed over time. And I, so I think either that or make the Fed democratically accountable, which is tricky. Um, but but generally, we we uh, this is a place for Congress. It, or we can say, look, we have this broken system. Let's make the best of it. And I, you know, that's a practical response. And I, I I'm. I'm fine with that too, but um, I would rather do it democratically. Emma, I'll turn the same question over to you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the Fed has been subjected to democratic process scrutiny at several points in its history from 1913. And each time those interventions failed. Um, the Fed, for instance, I'll take one that's more recent, um, 1978, we had the Humphrey Hawkins Act, where that statute brought under Fed mandate to do full employment and not just monetary policy. And 
It was put on the books after a long fight to make full employment one of the specific goals. What happened? The Fed ignored every single bit of full employment policy. They simply refused to implement it, ignored it, and it was many, many years before full employment came to be a part of what we call the dual mandate of the Fed. So that's one thing. Second failure is Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank was intended to introduce more democratic uh, features into the Fed decision making. One of the things they introduced was that all of their policies and special um, interventions in crises should in fact be a part of broad scale change. Uh, it should be applicable to more than one institution, as was the case at the beginning of 2008 when Bear Stearns and Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan Chase were the only beneficiaries of the very first rescue package. So that's what Dodd-Frank said. And the second thing they introduced in Dodd-Frank was that the Treasury Secretary should be consulted uh, since the Treasury Secretary is appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. So it was thought, oh, the Treasury Secretary has this democratic link. Well, we can see with the current COVID crisis uh, and how the Treasury Secretary and the Fed together are making transparency a joke that we don't have the kind of democratic penetration into who is getting the money, how much are they getting, and uh, are they, in fact, entitled. So those interventions for democratic change in the Fed have been problematic. Last thing I'll say about the Fed is that the Fed started as a progressive intervention in its predecessor, which was a crony structured private intervention after the financial crisis of 1907. What happened there? The original J.P. Morgan brought all of the boys into his uh, paneled office and said, you're going to take this much, you're going to take that much. And they acted like a central banker. And so that was private central banking. The problem with that is there are all kinds of crony, crooked deals that were a part of that decision making. And so cronyism is a part of the Fed heritage. It's there. It is, we can see it in the um, PPP program, the first tranche of PPP has a blatant display of cronyism that people who knew people, you know, I guess it was Abner Mikva who said when he first went to get a job as a student in uh, Chicago, they asked him who sent you and he said nobody and the ward boss said I don't want nobody that nobody sent. Okay, so that kind of uh, political uh, connection is a part of the heritage of the Fed. And you can see it in PPP, that some entities that got PPP money had to be shamed into releasing it. So you got Shake Shack, Ruth Chris Steakhouse, and even universities, Stanford and Harvard, uh, gave money back. But that was a small portion of the corporations, publicly traded corporations that could go to the market to get money, those corporations refused to give the money back of so, PPP loans. So we had shame and shamelessness. And the shameless simply said, I'm not giving it back. 
And these tended to be people who were connected to uh, the president's political fortunes, head of, uh, one was head of the uh, Republican Party in Illinois, and another in Dallas. So um, this problem is a big problem of the way in which we have democratic institutions, but we've got a history of cronyism that persists from 1907 uh, financial crisis and the 1913 progressive replacement, we are still in crony land. Uh, and we have these networks of people who manipulate financial results. Yeah, so I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's so interesting because um, as an economist, over the you know over most of my lifetime, we have been told that the um, that the Fed is really our first line of defense in times of recession. It is sort of this. It's it it is portrayed as this neutral. It's focusing on full employment. One just little data point I wanted to add in. We were talking about um, I think Emma when you were talking about race in the Federal Reserve um, is that there are actually some scholars, Jared Bernstein, Janelle Jones, who've just written a piece calling for the Fed to think about black unemployment as the full employment metric that we use rather than the aggregate number, something that I think is well worth um, discussing and, and talking about because we know that typically the black unemployment rate is twice that of whites. So mm -hmm. um, you're, you're never going to get to full employment for the whole country if you're focusing on the aggregate. But I think that you both are really raising some super important questions around um, how we think about economic policy, the role of democracy, and um, and then Emma, you know, you bringing in this role of cronyism at the at the tail end of your answer there, so important to understanding who is this benefiting, because if it isn't benefiting the whole, the common good, the whole economy, and it's just benefiting certain certain actors, that's only is going to bring you the kinds of strong, stable, broadly shared growth that the Federal Reserve's mandate is supposedly promising us. Um, so I want to just turn, I have a couple of questions here from the audience um, that I want to turn to. So um, would really like to focus on, as we kind of go through some of these questions, we have about 10 minutes left, um, want to focus on um, action. Like how do we actually get here? So as you're thinking about answers to these questions, really focusing on how can we get from here to there? I'm curious because both of you have thought, I know, deeply on these issues. Um, you know, one thing that uh, one of the uh, one thing that someone uh, wrote in is that uh, the Fed sometimes claims that questions around inequality or the racial effects um, uh, of their policies are beyond their purview. Right? They have that dual mandate, full employment, price stability, and nothing else um, matters. And um, can you both speak a, a little bit to you know whether or not you think that you know that the Fed's lack of attention to these very questions of distribution, um, does that actually make it harder for them to fulfill their mandate? I don't know which of you would like um, to take that first. Yeah, I think so. I, I mm -hmm. think it does uh, cripple them in addressing this issue of racial economic equality. Um, as I said, the Fed really uses this shield of neutrality to avoid major problems in our economy, and that is the cumulative effect of a long, long period of racial discrimination, a lot of it government discrimination. So we had first FHA, blacks were excluded from loans, the redlining phenomenon. Homer Hoyt was the economist who set this up, color coded it. We know that. But beyond those practices, there is an accumulation of other injuries that show their effects in the economy. Racial violence, the lynchings, police brutality, uh, employment discrimination. And the Fed has been, and still is, the most brilliant collector of data but they don't do anything with the data uh, to intervene in this long history of racial discrimination. So for me, it says that there is a need for a bold 
theory, for me, it's economic justice, which gives us the opportunity to explicitly consider economics and identity, race, gender, all of the variables that make up the human personality. And the Fed blithely ignores all of those. We are all widgets, just little pieces of uh, the economy. So, so that's one thing. And the last thing I'll say is we can go back in time to pick up the FDR proposal for having an economic bill of rights, a second bill of rights. The idea of uh, market determinism goes all the way back to Adam Smith. Right. So there's so let's, let's like in getting older theories and the FDR theory, economic justice are things, tools. Uh, ideas. They're, they're not tools so much as ideas. So let's let Marissa get in on this uh, question as well. Thank you, Emma. Um, I absolutely agree, agree with Eva on this erasure of uh, black uh, data. And, you know, Martin Luther King said in 1967, maybe, or eight, um, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, a white poverty, it's a depression, it's a social problem that we got to fix, right? Um, but when we think about black poverty, it's a, or he's like, you know, it's a societal problem. When we think about black poverty, it's a cultural phenomenon. And he's like, the black population has been in a state of per perpetual depression um, since emancipation. And if you look at the numbers, right, it has been an absolute, I mean, just complete, no, no real changes. Um, and so you look at uh, the recovery from 2008, so we say, well, well, the market recovered. Black families lost 53% of their wealth and it did not recover. Uh, black unemployment um, is, is low. You have every metric that you care about when you focus in on black poverty, black wages. Um, you know, there was an article today by Dave Leonhardt in the New York Times, he says, the wage gap hasn't even changed since 1950, black, white, racial wage, wage gap. And I actually don't, here I'm gonna excuse the Fed because it's not just the Fed. This is across society. This is Congress, this is economists. I mean, the profession of, of um, uh, um, economics, <laughs> I was gonna say economy, um, and law. And every profession that has designed these, these rules has either, they went from actual um, explicit exploitation and exclusion to just papering it over and talking about the laws of supply and demand as though the market created these gaps. And I, I do try to cover that intellectual history because I actually think, and maybe this is too bold of a, of a thesis, but I think you can't understand the libertarian move and the neoliberal move in the economics, but for that moment intersecting with the civil rights demand for economic justice. And by the way, the trans sort of national um, Cold War sort of thinking where you, they put, um, you know, and there's some intellectual entrepreneurs here, Alan Greenspan being one who was Nixon's advisor in 1967 through 68, you put any demands for economic justice, including MLK's demands that were, you know, now we've kind of whitewashed that history into, uh, this is communist and this is anti-capitalist. And so capitalism was used very much as a um, weapon against these, these claims. And so I think we're still in that, this is not just the Fed. Um, and I think this is the entire, the, the entire economics profession, legal profession, which I'm part of, um, and Emma is also a, a, a leader in, we have to reckon with this in, in a big, big way. So, you know, you remind me of um, you know, one of our research advisory board members is Lisa Cook. And um, mm -hmm. she just has gotten a lot of attention for some research that she did that I think it's worth telling our audience about here that it touches right on what you just said, Marissa, both of you, Marissa and Emma, that um, she did some research showing how um, hate related violence um, uh, against African Americans, against blacks in the late 19th and early 20th century significantly um, harmed their, um, their applications for patents because yes. people stopped believing that the government mm -hmm. would protect mm -hmm. their economic rights, yeah. mm -hmm. which meant that mm -hmm. our society lost 
all of this innovation and ideas, those communities lost that access to that um, path to engage in the economy. And our whole society lost inventions that, you know, could have propelled us to Mars or whatever it is that, you know, maybe people would have invented that just never happened. And so you think about the devastation that this has wrought and the, and the society-wide effects. I think it's important to, to add that to the, this conversation. So we're going to do a, um, end with just a bit of a lightning round um, of, you know, just to get to the, someone has asked really the big question here, which is, um, what are some practical options for a revision to the Federal Reserve Act? Like what, are, what are a few things that we could do um, just in our, we have about three minutes left. So um, Marissa, you want to start first and give a few and then we can go to Emma and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the problems with the CARES Act and one of the things that it highlighted is the Federal Reserve Act was meant to you know, equalize the industry. And at the time, and I think this is a flaw in the progressive um, thinking at the time and still um, today in that local localism and private is always um, better. And so even when we talk, even when progressives talk about it, it's, you know, reduce the monopolies and send it locally. Um, but but the, the assumption is that the Fed has to use banks as a middleman. So whether they be small banks or big banks, that becomes a problem. And I think that is a flawed um, reasoning. I think we have a central bank that has lots of tools in its power, and we do not need banks as middlemen. So the problem with the CARES Act and the PPP specifically is that you have to go through a bank to get it. Even the direct stimulus payment, you had people waiting in line for hours and hours just to pick up a check at the one ATM in Manhattan that didn't charge them an overdraft fee. You had some, some people who were unbanked waiting months and months who haven't gotten the check that they have to a check casher. And then on a large scale, that monetary policy, the buttons that the Fed is constantly pushing, and they know very well how to push, and they did, you know, 2008, develop brand new sort of buttons to push and, and I'm simplifying it, but, you know, repo markets and, and commercial paper, and, and that they did all in a weekend during um, the coronavirus crisis, all of those go through banks and through mar bank, uh, markets controlled by banks. And so I would say the, the main thing is to create either a public option or public access point. And there's a variety of ways um, that this can be done. And I'm ambivalent as to which one, you know, we can, I've proposed postal banking, I was testifying in Congress on Fed accounts. Um, the, the, the main premise being that if you have a central bank that is a public institution, make it available to the public and don't use banks as a middleman. I love it. Emma, what's your big idea? Yeah, the big idea includes uh, this concept that banks are the problem, that you've got to change the channels for distribution, as people say. You can't have the arsonists being brought in to put out the fires. And that's what we do. We did it in 2008 when, in fact, the banks were the arsonists and they were brought in to put out the fires. We had. Um, 20 banks in the entire world that were eligible as primary dealers, which is a elite group of banks with a special stability, but that also included American banks that it caused the crisis. So banks are a problem and I would propose that we cut banks out of this distribution channel. And one of the reasons we need to do that is, did you know, that with the PPP, the banks that participated in those grants, and they were grants because they were forgivable as long as the recipients complied with the requirements, those banks received a fee for handling PPP loans that was subtracted from the total amount of money that was committed by Congress. So. Um, these are usually for risk, and those fees were simply for uh, allowing your best friend to go to the head of the line. It's absolutely uh, unacceptable, and so you have the problems of banks, banks being uh, the vectors for self-interest, self-dealing, and also uh, the vector for uh, exclusion and continuation of racial subordination. Okay, 
Subordination. That's where we're ending our fantastic conversation <laughs> today. Um, thank you both. Thank you for all of your work on these issues and thank you for the brilliant ideas. Um, I'm going to hand the baton over to David Mitchell, um, who is our Director of Government and External Relations at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. And um, uh, yeah, I hope you all enjoy the next panel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heather, um, for that great conversation, uh, Emma and Marissa as well, uh, and for the introduction. Um, I'm really excited about this next conversation. Uh, it's a panel on building power for workers and families. Uh, and this discussion is going to focus on kind of another part of the economy where a power imbalance, where concentrated power at the top is constricting economic growth for everyone else. So we talked about the financial markets. Now we're gonna be talking about the labor market. Um, we're gonna take a fairly broad uh, definition of the labor market here. So not just the power of management to set wages uh, and the lack of worker voice in the workplace, uh, though we will be discussing those issues, um, but also who gets to even enter the labor market and on what terms. Uh, so we'll talk about black and Latinx and other people of color who face police brutality, health disparities, um, and other forms of discrimination that obstruct their ability to thrive economically. Uh, we'll talk about young people uh, and increasingly older people burdened by student debt, which affects their life and economic choices. Um, and we'll talk about uh, parents who lack access to high quality, affordable childcare, making labor force participation um, you know, incredibly difficult. Uh, so as the panelists um, join me here on screen momentarily, I'll just say a few more things about the conversation that we uh, hope to have from now until 3.30. Um, so as was true in the earlier conversation, the coronavirus recession um, did not create the problems that we're gonna discuss today, but it has crystallized them. Uh, so whether it's frontline workers lacking the power to demand personal protective equipment on the job, um, black and Latinx communities being ravaged by the virus, um, or parents watching the formal childcare industry collapse uh, these last few months while trying to juggle their own informal care arrangements and, and work. Um, so we have experts on all of those topics here joining me um, on the virtual stage. Uh, the one other, or two other things I'll say um, before we get into the conversation is um, one thing that I really wanna stress is that the, the victims here are not just those directly harmed by the policies and systems, but all of us. So when workers are forced to come to work sick, they spread the virus. Um, we've seen that uh, in the last few months. When wages stagnate, so does consumer demand. And when students, parents, and people of color are blocked from bringing their time and talents to the labor market, our entire economy's productivity suffers. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce um, the panelists, uh, the esteemed group here that we're going to be talking uh, about these issues. Um, all three of them are actually authors uh, of the Vision 2020 book that Heather referenced earlier. So they all wrote chapters uh, for that book that we'll be discussing. Um, and uh, we'll start with Naomi Zodi, who is an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy at the City University of New York. Her research centers on economic inequality in wealth and in health insurance uh, and examines the ability of public policies to reduce those inequalities. And her Vision 2020 essay, co-authored with Derek Hamilton, focused on student loan debt. Um, and she actually just with Derek has published a new piece on our website um, on why the coronavirus recession is an opportunity to cancel all student loan debt. Um, that article and other supplemental materials can be found on the event page that I think was dropped into the chat earlier. Um, let me do the few, two other uh, introductions and then we'll go back to Naomi for the first round of questions. So next up is Taryn Morrissey. She's an associate professor of public policy in the School of Public Affairs at American University. Uh, her work focuses on examining and improving public policies for vulnerable ch children, including early care and education, uh, nutrition assistance, and public health policies. And her Vision 2020 chapter was on the need for affordable, high-quality early childhood care and education for all. 
And finally, Alex Hertel Fernandez is an associate professor of international and public affairs at Columbia University, where he studies American political economy with a focus on the politics of business, labor, wealthy donors, and policy. And his Vision 2020 essay was on aligning US labor law with worker preferences. Um, and he also recently wrote a piece for the website on uh, the collective action responses that we're seeing now to the coronavirus crisis. So welcome all of you. Thanks for, for joining us virtually. Um, I'd like to start with some questions around the problems as you see them. So let's try to define the problems um, and how coronavirus has crystallized them for us. So Naomi, as a health policy expert, um, we should probably start with the health crisis. How has the current crisis revealed and exacerbated um, fragilities and inequities in the nation's healthcare system? Sure, thank you so much. I'm glad to be part of this conversation. Um, so like you said, I think that a lot of us have come to this understanding that what the virus and the crisis has done is like expose or exacerbate pre-existing inequalities. So pre-virus, basically what we had in terms of access to coverage is like, you know, you're born in the wrong neighborhood, you go to the wrong schools, you're likely to get a job that does not offer health insurance, and you're likely to have, you know, to die prematurely as a result of a number of different um, kind of effects. And so also pre-virus, we were kind of debating about what do we want to do about it? You know, I mean, uh, among the problems, for example, um, black women in this country, African-American women's um, maternal mortality rates are really high. So this isn't necessarily, you know, it wasn't a problem of the technology around um, childbirth and childcare. That's what a lot of the research has kind of started to show us. Uh, instead, it's been about kind of like the uh, relationship with providers, um, the institution of healthcare and healthcare delivery and kind of how racism weaves its way into all of these things and how inequality uh, or like kind of lack of representation weaves its way into all of those things. So, you know, we were kind of coming out of the Affordable Care Act where 20 million people gained coverage, uh, but we still had a major problem. Um, actually, I have a paper under review now that shows that like for people who were uninsured prior to the ACA, and not eligible for Medicaid, basically like the kind of the target population for the ACA's private insurance policies, for about 25% of them, it's cheaper to file for bankruptcy than to reach the deductible of the subsidized benchmark tier of, um, you know, so it isn't uh, of, of private insurance under the Affordable Care Act. So it wasn't really, it didn't fully solve the problem, even though it brought us some of the way. Um, and so I think that then when this virus came, it, um, kind of exposed how some of the challenges with having this patchwork system of coverage. And it also, um, in the fact that it's like infectious, and then it also exposes some of the challenges of having employment tied coverage, um, which was already inequitable, but which also becomes a lot more difficult to work with uh, when you have an employment crisis. Right, right, yeah, we've seen mass unemployment and with that a mass you know, health on insurance rise, which. It's a unique American problem, it seems. Um, so in addition to health insurance and health disparities, you've also done a lot of work, I know, Naomi, on um, generational inequality and the cost of higher ed. Um, it's been hard not to notice that the recent protests that have been led in the streets in recent weeks are being led by young Black people, for the most part, um, who, in addition to facing police violence and discrimination, of course, are also experiencing you know, 15 years now of real economic turmoil. Um, what do you see as the fundamental hurdles to achieving more generational and racial equity in the country? Yeah, so I think there's two. Um, and my slide, it kind of speaks to this, if you want to pull that up. Um, I think there's basically, there's these two problems. So one of them is um, right here in the middle. Uh, the black median household has only one tenth um, the wealth of the white median household. And so wealth is itself a generational concept. It's something that is handed down from grandparents and parents to children. Um, and that happens throughout the life course. Like the intergenerational correlation in net worth is pretty strong, like even before or outside of inheritance. It's just something that's just happening throughout life. And so black people haven't had very many generations to accumulate and transmit that wealth. Uh, it was only, you know, the 60s and 70s when some of the educational and occupational restrictions have been loosened. So when you're thinking about wealth on a time scale, 
um, it, it's just not a lot of generations. And also the big social um, middle class building exercises that have happened in this country missed black people, just actually, you know, um, explicitly excluded black and brown people. So that's a, that's a big hurdle that we're facing um, in terms of like the experience of life for black and white people. Um, and then on the right side of this graph, in the 99th percentile, in the 100th percentile, there's this other problem that's a huge um, challenge for how democratically to resolve kind of, you know, the distribution of, of access to resources. And that is like the heavy concentration of wealth amongst a small class of people who are also white. Um, so there's like a white billionaire class um, and, and the wealth that happens to escape their hands does not kind of like disperse itself equitably between the 99%. Um, but these are kind of two separate problems. And so what's difficult about that concentration of wealth is that um, such a small number of people who command so many resources, uh, even without like being mean, um, just kind of allocate resources towards solving the problems that are in their sphere or within their vision. And so if not everybody has access to those resources um, more equitably, um, the rules that end up being shaped and the institutions that come out of it will, will favor one group over another. Um, and so I think that what we're seeing in terms of people, young people, young black people in the streets, I think that they are coming together Again, rebelling against both of these issues, so, you know, so it's the issue of the the violence of the state um, and how it affects vulnerable people, like black people, basically, um, and also the fact that they are now coming out of the second recession in the past decade. So labor market prospects for young people are have been bleak and are looking bleaker. That combined with um, having the greatest educational debt burden of any cohort of Americans. Um, and so the prices year over year of education and housing and healthcare, they're rising faster than prices while median wages are stagnant. And by the way, you will not get a defined benefit pension. So um, I think that people are coming in solidarity. You know, I think that especially kind of the tagline of defund the police is about refunding public institutions as well and kind of thinking about what which institutions we want to reinforce moving forward as we're going to have to like rebuild things are they going to be the ones that um institute social control or those that kind of spread out access to justice and resources and wealth right right yeah no that's really interesting and those those stats are always so jarring um Taryn, I, just turning to you, another cost that young people I know and, and parents of all ages are facing is the child care, the explosion in child care costs over the last um, many decades. Uh, so turning to you now, um, you know, how has that problem played out both before and now during the coronavirus crisis? Sure. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much for, for having me in this uh, really important conversation. Um, yeah, the, the cost of child care have, have um, been twice the rate of inflation over the last two decades. So it's, it's, a, it's a heavy cost burden for families. But the, the COVID-19 crisis highlights and exacerbates the structural problems we already knew existed um, in many areas, as, as David and Amy were talking about, also in, in child care and how parents manage their work and family responsibilities and in turn have widened socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic gaps in families' experiences and, and also outcomes. So most parents with children require childcare while they work, at least pre-COVID, and more than 60% um, of children under five regularly attended non-parental care. And, but as you can see from this slide, before the pandemic, where children spent their time was dependent on their age and, and income. So children in low-income households and infants and toddlers are much less likely to be in center-based care or in regulated or, or licensed care more generally. So only about one quarter of, of young children in poor households were in center care compared to about 35% of those in non-poor households. And this is a problem because on average, center care tends to provide higher quality, more stable and reliable care than unregulated types of care, which better supports children's development as well as parents' employment outcomes. And these disparities in early care and education attendance result from the lack of supply, its high costs, and the general lack of public investment. So this is particularly true for children under age three. 
So in 2015, annual public expenditures on education per child age six through 17, so K through 12 largely, were about $12,300, compared to $1,350 per child before kindergarten. And most of this was spent on, on preschool, so just the year before kindergarten. Under age four, very little um, public money is spent on education, despite the, what, all we know about the science of early learning and the early childhood period. So as a result, it is families who are bearing the cost burden of early education at the lowest earning years of parents' careers. The families with children under age five spend on average 10% of their incomes on childcare, and low-income families spend 35%. Um, despite these high expenses, childcare should actually cost more, not less. Um, so due, the, due to the nature of care work, the quality rests on the strength and consistency of adult-child relationships. So the economies of scale don't apply like they do to other economic sectors. And most childcare expenses are labor. Um, currently, early care and education workers make very little. In 2018, childcare worker median annual wages were $22,290 compared to kindergarten teacher average wages of 56,850. Um, before COVID, more than half of childcare workers lived in households eligible for public assistance. Um, research shows that early childhood teachers of color are paid even less and have lower access to benefits like health insurance than their white peers. And so what results is high staff turnover, which is problematic for children's development, parents' employment, and, and program costs. And COVID puts all of these problems in stark relief, right? Right now, childcare is near impossible to find as currently most schools, childcare centers and summer camps are closed or, or very restricted. And these temporary closures have obvious cascading impacts on children's learning and development, but also on the programs themselves. We know that um, most childcare centers and, and homes are small businesses that operate on really thin margins and they won't recover from months of, of no or very little revenue this has resulted in mass layoffs and closures. Um, even more early educators have lost their jobs over the last few months than, than K through 12 teachers. And we know quite a few K through 12 teachers have been laid off. And a, a recent report estimates that four and a half million licensed childcare slots, about half of pre-COVID levels will be permanently lost following this crisis. So without swift and effective policy interventions, what will result is widespread shortage, short, excuse me, shortages of childcare and what remains will be really expensive and out of reach. And we know that it's, childcare is just necessary for our economic recovery, particularly one that's equitable. Um, before our, the pandemic, our economy lost an estimated $57 billion a year due to childcare problems. More than 2 million parents nationally, 9% of parents with young children, disproportionately mothers, had job disruption, disruptions due to childcare problems. And many parents, particularly mothers, will make the decision to drop out of the workforce altogether with cascading impacts for their careers, their families' economic security, and the overall economy. And it could set working mothers back decades. And it's going to widen socioeconomic gaps in young children's experiences and their school readiness at kindergarten with the families of, of children who can afford, or the children of families who can afford it, receiving these developmentally enriching experiences um, and early learning while their peers who can't afford it missing out and less prepared to enter school. Thanks, Taryn. Yeah, both the short and long-term ramifications seem, seem pretty dire. And, and I think even, even folks who normally have the means to afford high quality care, you know, through Zoom meetings and we're seeing in the background, the kids, I mean, it's just uh, pretty evident now that it's impossible to, to juggle everything, even for those who maybe were blind to that problem uh, ahead of time. Um, Alex, thank you for your for your patience. Okay, we're going to turn to you. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, Americans being blocked to even enter the workforce because of childcare, student debt, racial discrimination. Um, but we actually know that even once they get there, their jobs are pretty precarious. Schedules are unstable. Workplaces are unsafe. And as the current mass unemployment, you know, demonstrates, the um, the jobs themselves can quickly disappear. So as somebody who studies labor relations, what do you see as the core problem driving this fragility? Yeah, thanks for that question, David. And thanks to the Equitable Growth Team for inviting me to participate on this great panel and great event. Uh, so like the other panelists, I see the COVID-19 crisis as producing several new strains on the workplace and exacerbating existing ones. So when we think about new strains, I think the most obvious one is, like you mentioned, David, 
the health risks that many workers face, particularly those workers that don't have the option of working remotely uh, and have to interact on a daily basis with coworkers or members of the public, customers or clients. You also have the economic crisis that's produced by the, the downturn that we're experiencing. Um, and it's important to note that both of those crises have been felt uh, unevenly across the workforce, that much of it has been borne by Black and Hispanic workers. Um, in a recent survey of essential workers that I conducted at the end of April and beginning of May, I found that Black and Hispanic workers, for instance, who are on the front lines in these occupations still going to work, uh, were substantially more concerned about being infected or infecting others at their job than more white workers. Um, and on top of that, we know that the essential workforce draws disproportionately from Black and Hispanic uh, communities, particularly uh, uh, Black and Hispanic women. Um, but there's a final crisis, and this is one that I think has existed well before COVID-19 hit that has only exacerbated what we're feeling right now in the workplace. And that's the crisis of workplace voice. Um, by workplace voice, I mean the ability of workers to weigh in on decisions that are important to them on, every, on an everyday basis at their job. So that's how much they get paid, their benefits, the terms of their advancement, how they're treated by their managers, um, and of course, the health and safety conditions that they work under. Uh, and well before COVID, American workers faced a deficit in the sort of voice that they wanted, that they feel like they should have over all of these things, and the sort of voice that they actually had. To put some concrete numbers on that, uh, research from 2017 found that nearly two thirds of American workers, two thirds of workers, had less voice than they wanted over the terms of their wages, their benefits, and opportunities for advancement. Um, and even more relevant for COVID, a survey I conducted with the support of Equitable Growth in 2018 with Tom Koken and Will Kimball at MIT found that nearly half of workers said that they either had no say or very little say over the health and safety conditions at their job. But perhaps the most telling indicator that we have of this deficit of worker voice is the gap between the proportion of workers who say they want a union at their job, a formal mechanism through which workers can weigh in on all of these outcomes uh, and resources in their workplace, and the proportion of workers who are actually in a union. Uh, so in recent surveys, uh, nearly half of all workers say that they would join a union if one is not available to them right now um, at their job. But as we know, the union membership rate is at about 10% of the overall uh, workforce and even lower at around 6% of private sector workers. So clearly there's a big gap between what workers want and what they're getting. So let me bring this back to what we're seeing right now with COVID-19. Um, and as the slide that uh, you, you put up here indicates, there are some really important differences in the say and voice that workers have at their jobs and how well equipped they are to deal with the realities of COVID uh, uh, at their jobs. Um, so this draws from that survey of essential workers that I mentioned conducted at the end of April and early May. Uh, and it asked workers a variety of questions about the sort of COVID-19 related conditions at their jobs. Did they have PPE that they always used? Are they certain that they would get paid for sick days if they couldn't come to work because of a fever? Did they get tested for COVID-19? And did they have a place and a time where they could discuss problems or issues with workplace safety with their coworkers. Across the board here, we see that members of unions, um, again, this is looking at the essential workforce, but members of unions were substantially more likely in many cases to report all of these outcomes. Um, and it's important to note that these differences don't simply reflect differences in workers or jobs between different sectors, that they remain after we account for all of these factors. And I don't think that should come as a surprise because we know that this is a central function of unions to provide these kinds of resources that workers need and want at their jobs. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, it is a striking, striking difference. But like you say, that that is, I guess, what unions, you know, were, were created to do. Um, so now turning to solutions and maybe staying with you, Alex, for a second, and I'll turn off screen sharing um, so that we can uh, zoom in on, on our faces a little bit more. Uh, turning to you on the solution side, you know, given um, this question of kind of what workers want, how do we give them what they want? I mean, how, how uh you know what what policies um are you pushing for or do you think make the most sense for both uh addressing the current crisis and planting the seeds for long-term structural change that's a great way of framing the question david thinking about what we need to do now in response to COVID, and how do we set ourselves up for the kind of reforms that would 
reduce this deficit of worker voice that people experience. Um, and I think the first thing to say is that to the extent that worker voice helps workers get the kind of conditions that they need and want, it needs to be part of the public health response that states and cities are engaged in. Um, in terms of specific reforms, uh, the Clean Slate for Worker Power Initiative at the Harvard Law School just came out with a great report that has a whole bunch of, of mechanisms uh, and recommendations for achieving that kind of voice as part of a COVID-19 response. Um, I would just highlight four broad buckets of things that I think would set us up to increase worker voice now and in the future. Uh, the first is just making sure that workers are aware of the rights that they have to a, health and, a healthy and safe workplace. Research I've conducted suggests that many workers, uh, particularly workers with lower levels of formal education um, and those who earn lower wages, just aren't aware of the rights that they are already afforded under current law. Um, uh, so let alone that uh, they aren't even able to take advantage of those rights. And so I think something like having a workplace safety and health officer, someone who is elected um, from the body of workers at a particular work site could help ensure that workers are aware of those rights and, and can access them. You know, I think a second important step is ensuring that workers have a say in the sort of reopening conditions at different businesses. And so that means, for instance, having committees of workers and managers that meet regularly and produce standards that the, the businesses have to follow. Um, and that should also be mirrored at the sector-wide level. Um, if, we, if there are best practices for, say, fast food restaurants, we should be applying those across the board um, in particular states and regions. Um, we need to make sure that workers can hold their employers accountable. Um, we're seeing in this wave of strikes and protests that have happened in recent uh, weeks and months that workers feel like their employers aren't, uh, aren't responding to them. And so we need to ensure that workers have that voice to go on strike if they want to. And then finally, we need to create new mechanisms for workers to form unions. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, there's just a huge gap between the sort of union representation that workers want and what they actually have. And there's a whole bunch of things that I think workers um, should be experimenting with, um, with the help of local and federal policymakers in order to get that union representation. And it does seem like the, the public is, is at least momentarily behind, you know, the heroes, the frontline workers, and so maybe there's some way to, to capitalize on that, um, that political moment. Um, okay, snaking back around on this question of big, bold solutions um, that can make structural change, but also can address the current crisis that we're in, which is a little bit of a challenge. Um, Taryn, why don't we go back to you? Um, what are your policy prescriptions for the child care crisis that you laid out earlier? Sure. Um, well, right now we need short-term relief to keep existing child care programs afloat, both those that are temporarily closed and those that are serving the, the families of essential workers. So social distancing, lower child adult ratios, and enhanced cleaning are, are necessary for public health, but they increase the costs of child care. Um, furthermore, most workers are, are you know, poorly compensated, as I talk about, uh, talked about, excuse me, and lack employer-supported health insurance um, and are more likely to be women of color, yet they're serving on the front lines right now caring for the children of other essential workers. Um, and there are proposals in Congress for short-term relief to child care. Um, there's the Child Care is Essential Act by Representative DeLauro and others, um, and these will be really important in, in making sure that there's child care when the economy reopens, which States and cities, as they reopen and, and parents return to work, it's essential that, that child care be considered in economic plans. Um, an estimated one third of US workers have child care obligations, um, including myself. So I'm one of those people who often have children running in the, in the background at Zoom calls. Um, and in terms of longer term structural changes, uh, we, we need to fix the, the um, structural problems in the child care sector that were apparent well before COVID and only made more visible by the crisis. So this um, finding affor affordable, high quality childcare for young children will be even harder than it was before and it was already very difficult. Um, we know that programs like Head Start and other high quality early care and education program or early care and education can promote children's development and parents' employment. And we need much higher sustained investments in early care and education. These programs right now reach a small fraction of children who are eligible and those numbers that are eligible are just going to grow given the economic situation. Um, and these programs are powerful in, in narrowing socioeconomic and racial um, and ethnic gaps in school readiness. Um, we need them to adequately compensate the early care and education workforce and enable parents to work and advance their own careers. Um, 
So we, we need universal accessibility to affordable, high quality early care and education and expanses, expansions in public preschool, Head Start, particularly those that are full day, full year programs and in, in childcare subsidies that allow for the enrollment of more children. I would argue both those currently eligible as well as those from moderate income families also struggling with childcare expenses um, and that increased reimbursement rates uh, and so that salaries for workers can, um, can be commensurate with educational qualifications and experience would likely increase parental, particularly maternal labor force participation, um, at least hold it steady. As I mentioned, we're probably going to lose ground in that respect. Um, it, it, we know, for example, that an analysis of the Child Care for Working Families Act estimated that its implementation would, inc would create 2.3 million new jobs, both among parents entering the workforce as well as for new early care and education workers. So in some, these investments would promote parental employment, generate better jobs for, for the early education workforce, and help promote the skills of the, of the workforce of the future. And the pandemic highlights the need for, for um, more public investment to narrow inequalities and promote equitable economic growth overall. Yeah, no, absolutely. It seems like there's three different constituencies almost that get, you know, there's the kids, there's the parents, and then there's the childcare workers. All of them would benefit from a more um, equitable system and the economy overall would also um, benefit from that. Um, Naomi, turning to you now on this question of um, big structural policy change, uh, I referenced earlier your essay in Vision 2020 with, with Derek Hamilton on uh, canceling student debt. Can you explain a little bit about you know how that would work and what the rationale is for it? Yeah, so I mean, the way it would work is that we would just cancel all of it. <laughs> we would just no longer owe that debt. Uh, right now we have, like during the coronavirus, they've suspended payments until September where they're planning to restart that. And you know, Brookings had a projection prior to the virus that about 40% um, of student loan debt would enter default by 2023. Um, and, you know, we've had more than 40 million unemployment claims now. So I think that like, you know, so the federal treasury could just no longer reach into people's bank accounts, you know, and direct debit that money, because uh, they can stop garnishing people's wages. Um, and, and instead of punishing people for, you know, seeking higher education, for seeking social mobility, um, you know, find a way to reward it, uh, to try and find ways that people who are entering into uh, higher education are not um, deterred from that, you know, so that we can have like a globally competitive workforce on par with like other countries that do enable people to go and seek whatever education they want to without coming out with this big albatross of debt around their necks for the rest of you know their working lives so we can just stop and then also there's some like privately held student loan debt um and i think that the fed you know it, after the the reserve the the crisis the reserve bought up some toxic assets so these would be you know like random shopping malls that were under, you know, utilized, something like that. So they had banks had all of these bad assets on their books and the Fed bought them off. And basically they can do that. Um, but, you know, by buying off these private student loans that are usually settled on penny for pennies on the dollar anyway. Um, but regardless, I mean, all of it can be can be eliminated. It wouldn't even be, you know, macroeconomically really that. And a beautiful linkage between the first panel and the second panel there. That was great bringing the fact. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess even Congress recognized in their most it's in their most recent bill that um, you know you talked about the forbearance for six months, so people aren't paying right now. But obviously, um, a continuation of that policy or even an expansion of it would be would be welcome. Um, I have a few other follow ups for Naomi, but I do want to just mention to the audience that they should be submitting their questions. I'm gonna to turn to audience Q&A here in a moment. Um, so please do submit questions on the Q&A uh, chat function there on Zoom. Um, I know Naomi, you've also done work on uh, baby bonds, this idea of you know seeding money to, um, to young people that then grows as they age. You probably could do a better job of explaining it than I could, but um, can you speak to that a little bit and, and how that would also potentially affect the racial wealth gap? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so basically baby bonds, it's called baby bonds, but it's actually equity. It's just some nice um, consonants there. But basically it's just like universal publicly funded trust fund accounts. So everybody would get something, but uh, the wealthiest would get the least and the least wealthy would get the most up to like $50,000. So you get it at birth, um, but you can't touch it until you become a young adult and it's kind of growing on your behalf in the meantime and now you gain control over it as a young adult. Um, and so the idea of making it based on wealth specifically is to address that issue of like intergenerational wealth transfer and just like that legacy of exploitation. So even if you did it on the basis of income, uh, it would be less well targeted um, in like redressing the historical inequities because even at the same level of income, African-Americans tend to have less wealth. Um, and so that, that disparity is largely a function of assets uh, rather than debts. So, you know, solving student, or like eliminating student loans for everybody um, kind of like just gives people access to education and to upward mobility and to making that choice and investing in their futures. Um, but, you know, giving people assets um, kind of like, you know, it stops the uh, kind of creation of further disparity to eliminate the student loan debts, um, but the assets re redresses or addresses kind of the, the previous um, uh, legacy. But yeah, it would only be like 80 billion a year, which is about the cost of SNAP. And at the median, young adult households, I have a study that um, came out, it was published, I guess, this year, like late last year. Um, at the median, looking at just young adult households, um, the disparity is about 16 to 1 uh, for white, like, where young white adults have like 15.9 times the wealth of the young black adult household at the median. Um, and with baby bonds, only 80 billion per year, um, you would, it would reduce it to a factor of 1.4, um, which is like, you know, so basically, we, these kinds of social programs that we've done to build a middle class, like they could be really effective and they're totally doable. Um, and of course, that's when they become young adults. And so a lot of that process of kind of, there's a concept of cumulative advantage or cumulative disadvantage that happens like during, you know, once you start your job and you're, you have differential savings rates, if your income is much higher, you can save more. And so that wealth disparity grows over the life course. So it would be almost eliminated for young adults, um, but we would, certainly need to pair that with um, um, improving institutions like uh, so that they don't just spend it all on tuition, which imagine in 20 years where the price of, uh, of higher education could land, um, but it could be a really useful tool. And that tension between kind of more targeted aid um, versus the universal benefit. So I know there's been some critiques of the cancel all student debt um, proposal for you know, potentially being regressive because it helps, you know, doctors and lawyers who have lots of debt, but maybe not much need. How do you, I know you talk about it in the chapter, so I'm just setting this up as a, um, as a straw man here. How, how do you um, respond to that critique? And uh, uh, yeah, what's your, what's your answer? So actually a really high rate of Black graduates, college graduates go on to higher education. They're actually overrepresented in higher education or in like graduate education um, relative to the proportion of the United States population. Um, so, and, and what happens is though, like for every level of higher education, uh, black people are going to be disproportionately burdened by student loan debts relative to their white counterparts. So, you know, the idea of like solving the racial wealth gap by letting those black people who do get graduate education hold on to their debts um, is just like, well, it's just really not a solution at all. Um, great. Well, I think uh, I'll turn now to a few audience questions. Um, this has been a really interesting conversation and we've gotten some, um, some, some great questions coming in. Um, so let me just take a look here. Uh, So there's, there's talk about a looming crisis for working parents if schools can't fully open safely in the fall, um, but parents must work. From both a labor and childcare standpoint, what do policymakers need to do to make this sustainable, assuming the virus is still not under control? Um, Taryn, do you wanna try that one? Sure. I mean, it's this is a really hard, hard question, um, and I um, I struggle with this myself. As I mentioned, I have two young kids, and so um, I, I empathize uh, um, with many parents. It's um, uh, 
I think, you know, there, there's so much science to be done about um, children transmitting the virus and, and, and safety mechanisms. So all that aside, I think what's clear is that um, early care and education programs and what we might consider after school programs might replace school for certain days, um, child care programs for, for school age children need to meet certain public safety measures, presumably, and they'll need investment to do that. We know that K through 12 education has, has, has testified to Congress and, and um, advocated for more or that they need more funds um, to have children, um, fewer children per classroom, per adult, to have pods, et cetera. Um, and we need that to, to make sure that the, the learning loss isn't um, as bad as many fear, many estimate, um, particularly inequitable learning loss um, among socioeconomic and racial and ethnic lines. But so I think that's true in, in childcare too. We need um, uh, to make sure that programs stay um, open, um, number one, and that they, they have the tools to be able to pay workers adequately, particularly this might include hazard pay, um, but also that um, they can put these measures in place. Right. Um, we have another question here from Corey Clemmer. Uh, can you layer on the role of the criminal justice system in this analysis? Um, so maybe a little curveball. I don't know if anybody uh, wants to take it. Another another major obstruction for people entering the workforce and being able to, um, uh, you know, thrive economically. Um, yeah, well, it's, it certainly is. I think it's kind of interesting, like in the case of New York City. I mean, certainly when you think about COVID and how it's kind of spreading in jails and we're really not addressing that problem. Um, and we have like so much turnover between our jails and our communities, especially black communities. So like that's kind of going to drag out the tail probably. Um, you know, but then there's also the issue of like just the, the institutions that we choose to build um, in that like, you know, after crime fell, prisons grew uh, in a way that was not related to one another. Um, in fact, like virtually a identical percentage of high school seniors have smoked marijuana at some point in their lives. Um, and yet we just imprison, you know, black students or black children or black young adults for that. Um, and then they come out and then they're barred from, you know, from engaging in anything. Um, and what happens is while they're, in there, in a lot of states, they're getting paid really small wages for um, for the work that they're doing. They, uh, I think, they farm the fish that's sold at Whole Foods. Some of it. Um, so, like in Arkansas, in Louisiana, at the Angola prison, you know, I mean, so it's um, this kind of like heinous institution, and it's so huge, and we're kind of not dealing with it. Sometimes we try to do little things, kind of like with the Affordable Care Act, you know, as opposed to solving the problem. Um, but I think that as they become more and more of like an economic force, as they have already, uh, it just gets harder and harder. So actually in healthcare, the corporation, like I want to say GeoCor, I don't know. Anyway, the corporation, Molina, Molina and Centene, they are corporations that provide correctional healthcare, correctional, right? I mean, so some, the healthcare that we give people when we punish them, um, they have become, they've started to like, they also do Medicaid managed care and they're actually entering into the non-group marketplace in the Affordable Care Act, which the Affordable Care Act's non-group marketplace is, you know, they have these really high, deduct like the median deductible is like $4,000. So, so anyway, um, it becomes a, a, a bigger and bigger force and more and more difficult to reckon with as that power is, has been like concentrated, but specifically into this really uh, unnecessarily violent, just like destructive uh, facet of our society. Yeah, and to layer on to um, everything that Naomi said, there's a worker voice dimension to this as well. Um, some really fascinating research from my Columbia colleagues, Adam Reich and, uh, and Seth Prince showed that people who had spent time in, in the prison system, formerly incarcerated individuals, are much less likely to both join unions and try to form unions or express worker voice at their jobs because um, they're so fearful of losing the precarious position that they have in the labor market. We have so much research to suggest that um, these folks have a really hard time even getting a foot in the door that they're discriminated against in, in systematic ways. And so when they finally find employment, um, often at places like Walmart, they're reluctant to do anything that could, um, that could result in them losing their jobs. And therefore they're missing out on this important element of voice in the workplace. That's a really interesting angle, Alex. Um, 
so one one other audience question is what is the most important lesson each of you think we can learn from policies passed during the great recession or great depression um so i don't know to what extent those will end up being corollaries to our current experience um alex i know the Net national labor relations act in 1935 was passed during the great depression i don't know if you want to speak to that or if others want to jump in with kind of lessons from recent economic, I guess not that recent in the case of the Great Depression, but um, in other uh, economic crises the country has faced. Sure. I mean, I think it comes back to where you started us, uh, David, which is to say, was there an element of structural reform that not only provided relief for the economy in the moment that we're at, uh, at this crisis, um, but did it actually change the way in which the economy functioned? And I think that's what made the New Deal so, uh, so pivotal in, in structuring the American economy. It changed the rules of the games and created new institutions in particular for workers and less advantaged people to have a say both in the economy and in the democracy. Um, and so it remains to be seen whether we'll, we'll have a similar moment now, but that certainly wasn't the case during the Great Recession. You didn't see that same kind of institution building that endured past the relief efforts. Yeah, I would say that's, that's true with early childhood too. I mean, what, what happened during the Great Depression was actually World War II precipitated this huge investment in, in direct public provision of childcare, the Lanham Act, which um, it just was, was created because so many mothers had to go to work and, and, re and replace uh, men who were fighting overseas. And it was, um, research has shown, recent research has shown it was improved child outcomes um, and uh, it was, it was a, a success in many respects. And um, it just dissolved. I mean, all those, oh, those public provision of centers dissolved as, as men came back and um, women um, uh, receded from the, the labor force. And during the, the Great Recession, there was a, a, certainly an analogous kind of um, investment. And, and um, in many ways, childcare subsidies, which with their um, funding remained flat um, across um, much of the last decade, not the last two years has been different, but, um, but as a result, fewer children received subsidies. Um, there was a, a bump in Head Start um, dollars during the Great Recession, which was really important for, for many kids. And so we can learn from those examples. Yeah, I know, I know Sam Abbott on our staff at Equitable Growth wrote a piece on, on the World War II experience. Um, and yeah, what a missed opportunity there not to kind of keep those investments sustained as opposed to letting them dissolve, like you say. Uh, Naomi, do you want to get in? Yeah, I think that like to, what to keep in mind is that um, the initiatives that we're going to undertake are going to be successful. We just have to be really careful about what our long term goals are. And I think that, you know, we want to um, and especially uh, contrasting with how we reacted to the financial recession of 08 is like benefiting people uh, over markets and all people. Um, especially those who are the most vulnerable, because if they're made better off, everyone is, you know, if you think, so to quote Derek Hamilton, uh, my co-author on that piece, you know, the household that's in poverty almost by definition has to consume the marginal dollar that they're going to receive. So when we build up the, the, you know, the most economically vulnerable, that's what spurs aggregate demand. And like a lot of corporations have revenue problems, actually, even prior to the coronavirus. Um, so, so we can spur aggregate demand by lifting up the most vulnerable, and I bet it'll work. Well, on that optimistic note, unless there's uh, <laughs> any other final final words people want to say, I, I think we'll have to end it there since we're almost at time. Um, but I want to thank the audience uh, for their attention and good questions. I want to thank uh, Naomi, Taryn, and Alex for uh, their, um, their presentations, as well as uh, Emma and Marissa and Heather from the first panel. Um, there are, as Heather said, lots of Equitable Growth staff that helped make today possible, so I want to thank all of them as well. Um, please stay tuned for more Equitable Growth and Vision 2020 content uh, that is going to be focused on the coronavirus recession and the 2020 economic policy debate going forward. Every day we're posting uh, new material on our website, equitablegrowth.org, um, and as I mentioned, Earlier, the, the link to the event page that we posted in the chat earlier will take you to a slew of additional materials, um, including a, a PDF that summarizes uh, the policy recommendations that were laid out um, during this panel at the Vision 2020 book. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for, for uh, your attention and uh, we'll see you either virtually or in person sometime soon, I hope. Thank you. <laughs>